So Mitch mentioned, you know, went through this presentation uh, with your students. So got a lot of great feedback from them in terms of things that they wanted me to touch on in this presentation with you all. And I'm going to go through similar rundown uh, with you that I went through with them, albeit catered a little bit more specifically to coaches. And the goal here is to keep this within an hour. <laughs> Mitch knows I can go on tangents. So the goal also is to entertain you while challenge you intellectually in a in a in a collaborative way when I say challenge because this was a topic mental health that when I first heard it it didn't apply to me if you asked me five years ago if I would be doing anything related to the field of mental health I'd be like you're out of your mind you know I, I know that almost sounds like a pun but that's really how it felt to me and so as I take you into here what I want to start with is the world and the space of mental health and even understanding what it is. I think we're at this place right now where, where we as a society, if, if we ask 10 different people, what is mental health? We'd get 10 different answers. And there's reasons for that, right? It's, it's, not, it's not any one person's fault or one organization's fault. But I put this slide up here where you see everyone making the sign that we make as an organization, which is same here, you see in our logo, thumb pointed at me, ping, finger, pinky pointed out all at you, we're the same. We're going to get into why we use that messaging in the space of mental health. And you see different organizations that we work with from professional sports to college to K through 12s to servicemen and women and first responders. This is not the way our society looks at help, like a, we're all in it together type of conversation. And, 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 you know, you got a question, why is that the case? So Quickly, just to engage you all, and you can either unmute yourself or if you want to type it in the message boxes, when you think of the term mental health, and no holds barred here, say whatever you want to say, what images, what other word associations come to mind when you hear the term mental health? Life balance. Mm -hmm. And again, no holds barred. Broken. Okay, perfect. Struggles. Day-to-day -day thoughts, self-care, depression and anxiety, healing, awareness. Brave. Brave. What was that, Valentin? Brave. Brave. Okay. Stigma, weakness. Okay. Stress. Awesome. These are great. Thank you all for sharing those. And thank you, Valentine, for, for chiming in here. So I've asked this question now with just this sign of mental health up here at 41 different sessions where the group was only mental health professionals. So even though we present to all different groups like coaches here in this case, this particular question, the way that I've asked it to mental health professionals specifically when it's only them in the room is, if you are able to put on the left-hand side of a sheet of paper, every positive word association that comes to mind when you hear the term mental health, and in the right-hand side in red, every negative word association that comes to mind when you hear the term mental health, please share that. And I want to see what the answers look like. And in those 41 sessions now, I've added them up to see what are the most common terms that come to mind, right? We always think left to right, green that we write on the left side, we think is a more, you know, forceful or, or you know, means go color. Okay. And in doing that 41 different times, here are the top 20 plus words that have come up in terms of frequency. Over 20 words, the most common words that have come up, all negative. Weak, failure, lunatic, crazy, nuts, mental hospital, alone, isolated. You guys could read through the list right there. And this phrase that's up there is mental health. It's not mental illness. It's not depression. It's not anxiety. I, I'm also not saying that positive words didn't come up because you guys all came up with some positive words in there as well. But the most common when we heard the term mental health was these negative word associations. Why is that the case? When we think of physical health, we think of six pack abs, we think of doing squats at the gym, we think of better sex in 15 days, nutritious foods that we can eat. Yet when we think of mental health, this is what comes most frequently to our mind. And this is from mental health professionals where this comes to mind. So I became fascinated with why that was the case by going through my own lived experience story. I'm gonna take you through a very quick road of my own career and then this crash that I had that happened with me and what it propelled me to now do for the rest of my career and you know greatest I guess you know crashes then leaving to towards the greatest opportunities and I truly believe that now but seeing mental health from a very different angle than what our society in mass currently sees it as 
And when I started to communicate my story and share it and share it from a different angle, what started to happen was, granted, it was helpful that we had relationships with athletes, you'll see in a second on the professional level, but we started to get reached out to by colleges and universities. So from Cornell on the East Coast to USC on the West Coast. And when we started sharing the programming that we were doing, then we started to get reached out to by different segments of society. So K through 12s, corporate offices, military and first responders. We're going to the Department of Defense next week and then sports teams and leagues. Why do I bring this up? Not for credibility purposes, not to pat myself on the back at the beginning of a presentation. I bring this up because what it's showing is these different segments of society are finally taking notice that this stuff is important, it matters, and it's impacting productivity and it's impacting health. Okay, the fact that they're being proactive and asking for programs is telling. And so you look at this slide right here, I'll ask you guys to do it in the chat feature again. You see different names, so I'll read them across, but it's Kevin Love, Demi Lovato, Kate Spade, Carson Daly, unfortunately, Tyler Holinsky, which many of you know being on the West Coast, uh, Kanye West, Avicii, who's the DJ, uh, Dak Prescott, Delante West, Antonio Brown. Put in the chat or say out loud, these are the, the most popular athletes. Maybe I don't have uh, 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 Lady Gaga and, and Michael Phelps up there. I could add them as well. But these are some of the most popular athletes and celebrities as it, as it pertains to, yes, Britney Spears most recently. As it pertains to Britney Spears, Britney Griner. I actually just connected with her agent. I can't wait to talk with her. But as it pertains to um, uh, mental health, what terms come to mind when mental health is brought up with any of these public figures? What word associations, again, what have you heard about what they're going through? Out of control, okay? And you could name a specific person and say like, Kanye West, this. Tyler Holinsky, this. But so far we have out of control. Depression. Delante West, drugs. Okay, let's take one more. Demi Lovato, drugs. Bipolar, okay, unhappy, awesome. I don't say awesome, meaning it's awesome they're feeling this way. I mean, awesome that you guys answered this way. Here's the takeaway from this slide, which, which, which is what got me when I went through what I went through, is that I just read these names to you. And when I asked this question, what do we know about these people relative to mental health? And you see the quotes in the top, our news. We get our news through social media nowadays. It's the, it's the fact of it. Fairly or unfairly, that's where we learn about things. We look at our Twitter feed or elsewhere, or we go to the links on the internet. So we've learned that Kevin Love has anxiety and panic attacks. He ran off the basketball court. Demi Lovato, someone said it before, drug use, depression. Kate Speed, suicide. Carson Daly, anxiety. Tyler Holinsky, suicide. Kanye West, someone said it before, out of control, crazy, bipolar. Avicii, suicide. Dak Prescott, depression during the pandemic, according to Skip Bayless, only pandemic related, okay? Delante West, shirt off, walking around the street homeless, drugs, bipolar, okay? Um... Antonio Brown, crazy actions, throws bricks at his movers uh, out of control, okay? We learn about where they end up and where the end result is and what the label is. And I like that someone put up here, they're just going through normal issues that many people go through, raise the roof, but that's not what we are told. <laughs> what I just went through and what, I, what, what, I, what gets shared with me is this list that you all share with me. When I go, you think right now of Kevin Love, most of us know him as this star basketball player who played for UCLA and then dominated with the Minnesota Timberwolves. When I go around to colleges and high schools now and I ask who Kevin Love is, they have no idea about his basketball playing career. They're, oh, he's that bench player for the Cavaliers who's hurt, but he, uh, he ran off the basketball court with a panic attack, right? That's what they know when it comes to mental health. So as a starting point in the news, Outside of people who live in this space every day who know what mental health is, this is where we're getting educated. This is what we hear about people who go through stuff, these labels and these end results. Now, take that on top of what those of us who are on this call, who are the coaches of these students right now, when we were in school, I can speak for the 80s, 90s, 2000s, okay? When we were in school, these are the simplicities of what we learned. Depression means, and think about this in your head as I'm saying this, Sadness. Anxiety means nervousness. PTSD happens to 
servicemen and women and first responders. Finally, this is the interesting one because when you go to K through 12s now, they have pupil support services and they have social workers and they have school psychologists. When we were in school, there was a guidance counselor. That was it. And the people who went to the guidance counselor were the bad kids, the kids who did drugs, the kids whose family had a major catastrophe happen. That was it. Everyone else was fine, healthy, normal, and okay. So this is the bedrock of education or lack thereof. We were given, unless we went to extra schooling on it, of what we learn in school. And, we, and I've had people facetiously say, Eric, my school didn't teach even any of this. So it was whatever we picked up on TV or didn't pick up at all. All right, so before going into my story, quick exercise. You see the plane up there on the screen. So for 10 seconds, indulge me, close your eyes for 10 seconds and a, a picture that you're able to charter that plane that you just saw and take it anywhere in the world you want with everyone that's on this call with us. It could be a tropical destination. It could be a ski resort. There's no COVID for 24 hours and we're enjoying our time for 24 hours. Have a great time. Plane flies back. We land. We're now back here in the session. You could open your eyes. Okay, so when I said airplane, and it's hard to do because we can't see everyone on video right now, but just saying the term airplane and seeing that airplane in that picture without any type of airline specifically on it, your mind went to one of two images. It either went to this green smiley plane with the smile in the cockpit and the wing welcoming you on, or it went to this mean red plane with the fangs coming down and the and the uh, the eyebrows all pointed, telling you don't come on this plane. Okay, so said in another way, some of us think of the plane as it's a train that has wings that flies in the sky that gets me to my destination more quickly. I can recline my seat. I get served food. I get to go on Wi-Fi. This is amazing. And some of us think of a plane and we're like, this is a death trap that could fall out of the sky at any moment. I don't want to get on that. Okay, if you guys remember the athlete Royce White who played for Iowa State back in the day, that's how he felt about planes. And he was open and honest about it. When I ask a room how many are in the green, how many in the red, it's usually about 75, 25, but it doesn't matter. It could be 99% to 1%. The point of it is, how do we get that we see the exact same object, this plane? It's based on our lived experiences. Some of us were on a plane at three years old. We had terrible turbulence and the plane felt like it was going to fly out of the sky at any moment and fall. Uh-oh, what might happen? Now we had no words to verbalize it and that remain spinning in our minds every time we were about to get on a plane. For some of our kids who never lived through 9-11, but they see it in a documentary, their mind goes to what they saw in 9-11. For some of our kids, unfortunately, especially with you all living on the West Coast, they saw the helicopter fall out of the sky with Kobe Bryant and all those innocent victims that were on the helicopter with them. And their mind associates vehicle up in the air, plane, helicopter, similar, that scares me. Point of it is, yes, adverse childhood experiences, but even, you know, the reason I bring up, I think ACEs falls a little bit short, is there's very specific traumas that have happened where, where they bucket it and then they categorize it. It could be something as simple as I tripped when I was walking down the street with my parents and a car came near me and almost hit me. And that now becomes, I'm afraid to walk near the, 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 the street anymore. I have to walk further away on the sidewalk because I'm afraid of cars now. It's, it could be anything that gets caught in our mind and stays in there. And especially in a society where I showed 80s, 90s, 2000s, where we didn't talk about these things. And these things are, now it becomes bigger and bigger spaces in our mind. So I mentioned I was going to go through my career and kind of how it led to this. But my story, what I hope is, it's applicable to you all when you think about your lives and then applicable to what you're thinking about when you think of the athletes that you work with. So probably much like many of you, I grew up being sports obsessed, playing every sport that I possibly could in high school and middle school and all that stuff. End up going to school, go to Cornell University. Not a very good athlete. I'm just a decent athlete. I'm only 6'4 and I'm not 6'8. So I walk on to the basketball team there of all things my senior year. A whole other story there I'll sh I could share with some of you guys another time why it was only my senior year. But I'm staying in this myopic focus, and I, I really want to hit on that term because you all are coaches who you love your sport, you love your coaching, and that is what wakes you up every single morning. That's what it felt like for me playing sports and then wanting to continue my career in sports, now working in sports. So I get this job at the NBA league office right out of school. 
go to work. You might, when I speak with folks closer to my age, it's like you mentioned people like Jay Williams in that picture or Nene or Drew Gooden or Stefan Marbury or, or Yao Ming. Those names resonate. When I mention it to the kids in college now, they, they have no idea who those people are. So early on working for the NBA league office, getting a chance to present to the players about the business side of basketball and explaining to them how the revenues are shared between players and owners. And then from that, get an opportunity to go work in Chicago with the Bulls and the Sky as they were starting up with the Phoenix Suns and Mercury when Amari and Nash were there. Certainly Diana Taurasi was still there right now. And then finally go to New Jersey with the Devils, get a chance to go to a Stanley Cup final in 2012. We lost to who, whoever of you all out there are Kings fans since you live out in Cali. So you, you crushed my dreams. And then get this next position, which was my most recent and, and last position in professional sports, which was chief revenue officer. I put quotes around that because look in sports, it's a hierarchy, much like it is in coaching. You want to keep moving up and moving up. And I got into that cycle of nose to the ground, working really hard. And I get this position, which is one step away from my dream job, which is to be the CEO of a team. I get this job as a CRO chief revenue officer. And you see these pictures and you see these smiles there in the space of mental health. We're always hearing, Oh, that person was wearing a mask. They didn't really have a smile on. No, I really was enjoying my time down there. New ownership group purchases the team, military background, West Point grad. They have a West Point president who's my boss at the time. And you see me down there. I've got friends coming and visiting, taking pictures on the ice, wearing my, uh, my, my Halloween costume that I bought in a store the first uh, October. I'm down there and I, and I get chance of that's the biggest Woody I've ever seen as I'm, as I'm walking down Los Olos Boulevard. I, I, I mentioned these little tidbits, these jokes, maybe my jokes are worse than, uh, than Mitch's, but only because, you know, this smile that you saw was real. That's how I felt that first three, four months down in Florida. Then all of a sudden things start to change about four month March hits. And you see these four pictures around the main picture up here is I started to lose interest in things outside of the office. I start to lose interest in hanging out with my friends, start to lose interest in going to the gym or having any energy for it, start to lose interest in, you know, watching TV, uh, watching my, my, my teams on TV, maybe because I'm a Knicks fan and an Islanders fan that was justified. But, but even so it was, you know, I, I just, when I came home, I didn't even care to put it on playing in the leagues and teams recreationally. And the only thing I could keep focus on was my job. That's the only thing that kept me afloat. And again, thinking about your athletes and the sports that they play, or you all in the sport that you coach, oftentimes this is the case. We've got one thing that's driving us. And if other things are going, oh, I'm not as interested in hanging out with my family. I'm not as interested in this stuff. We justify that. And that's what I did. I justified, oh, this is the world's way of telling me I need to focus even more and more on my work. So instead of getting in at seven o'clock, I'd get in at 6.30. Instead of leaving at 12 at night, I leave at 12.30. And that's all it was, it was an excuse because I wake up one morning and now this is about the five month mark. So still pretty early in my tenure there. And I feel like I need to push myself out of bed like I'm in quicksand. And I walk over to the closet and it feels like every step I'm taking, there's cinder blocks on my feet. And I look in the closet and it feels like a bomb has gone off. Even though my clothes are organized, you got much more space in Florida than you do in New York. So everything's organized, but it feels like this mishmash in my head. I definitely did not shower that morning. I did not do my care routine. I put on whatever clothes I could. I, I get into the office hoping that my brain is going to somehow clear up. And I get into the office. There was no one there to document it. So you see the picture on the right is just a stock image. That's what I looked like in my office behind my wall. And the computer felt like looking at light brights to me. Even though Emails are normally uh, uh, evenly organized on your screen, one row after the other. Light brights of just things kind of popping out. I couldn't make one out to the other. It felt like I couldn't form sentences as people were coming to the office asking questions. So I just closed my door. And we had prospects out at the game that night. And usually you have to give a speech when these prospects come out because you want them to join the team as a season ticket holder or a corporate partner. And you know what it's like when you have someone come on campus and you're given a recruiting speech you do it every day. So it just comes from the heart. So for me, it would have been Alexander Barkov and Jonathan Hooper to just join the team as first round picks. And we got a brand new head coach and a new ownership group that came in. Things that come naturally to me right now. But at the time, I get up there and I'm in the suite five minutes before these prospects come in. And I just write down on a sheet of paper, 
hi, my name is Eric Houston. I'm the chief revenue officer with the Florida Panthers, and I couldn't think of anything else. And fortunately, a team president was in the, in the room at the time, and I just passed it off to him. And I walked out like you see someone who's maybe just injured and can't continue on. I walk out of that suite and go right back to my office. And so end of the night, I stayed in the office the whole time. Team president, owner come up to me, really supportive, right? And, and to give you some context, this is the beginning of 2015, this is happening. So if we're still at a place where we have to open up the conversation, you know what it was like back then. And they said, Eric, you know, we, we could tell if something's up. Is everything okay? We want to make sure we're being supportive. And I said, guys, I don't know what's going on with me. I don't know if I have a brain tumor, if I had a traumatic brain injury when I was younger, when I was playing sports, and it's just coming to fruition now. I don't know if it's this thing called mental health. My brain is not working. It's not functioning. And I'm not being a good employee for you. And I'm not being a good uh, uh, human for myself. And so Owner said the most supportive thing he could possibly say. He said, Eric, we never leave a soldier out in the battlefield. Take as much time as you need, one month, two months, three months, come back, hit the ground running. And when your identity as a person for so long, for those 15 years was Eric, the sports executive, the only thing my mind can focus on is I want to get back to being in that position. So when I hear three months, my mind goes to that. And I think to all the commercials I've seen because we didn't have education, so the most recent commercials are pharmaceutical commercials where it's usually a cartoon character. Sometimes it's just a blob. It's not even a person. And the blob has a sad face on it and gray clouds above it. And then 15 seconds into that 30 second commercial, you take a pill and the sad face becomes a smiley face. The clouds go away. It's blue skies. The birds are chirping. Everything's great. I didn't think it would be that easy, but off the heels of what we do when we're younger, when we have strep throat, bronchitis, pneumonia, and our parents take us to a doctor and we get an antibiotic, why wouldn't we think that a medication is the be all end all and a cure for us if something is wrong with us? So I go back to New York. I leave all my stuff in my apartment in Florida. I can't afford to have two places. So I go back to my parents' house, twin bed, okay? Same bed that I grew up in as a kid. And I lay down there getting ready to go to doctor's appointments and see what's wrong with me. And that picture, which it's a little gross to call it out, you could see the ring of sweat around my neck there. My brother took that three weeks into being there. I laid in that bed like that. You look at the probably the most important part of that picture is the blank stare in my eye that I didn't even realize my brother's taking this picture is I did not watch TV. I did not listen to the radio. I barely answered my friend's text messages because my brain just felt shut off. And it felt shut off and I was in that position for two and a half years from beginning of 2015 to the middle of 2017. And 99% of that time in the bed in that position. The other 1% was spent going to doctors where I was handheld and walked there looking at the world like this, where everything felt flat and like nothing was registering to me. And every time I went to a doctor, the idea was, cause I'm a stubborn bastard and I'm competitive and I wanna feel better. So I was willing to take whatever it took to feel better. So think in your mind, as I ask this question, how many different drug types can you try over a two and a half years period? I was tried on over 50 different psychotropic drugs, every SSRI, SNRI, MAOI, and tricyclic. Now, what I'm giving here is not a, a, a bashing of medication, we'll get into medication in a second. Just for me, medications were not working, but I didn't know any better. There was nothing else to try. So I kept going back to the well, hoping that something was eventually going to kick in for me. When it didn't, I was then told to do what's called TMS therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, where they shoot electromagnetic waves into your brain to try and wake up your brain and get the synapses going or, or the neurons firing through the synapses, almost like restarting your computer a little bit in a way. And 23 sessions into that, 23 days in a row, they do it for 45 minutes per session. I can't fall asleep the night of the 23rd. And the morning of the 24th, going all through that night. So the morning of the 24th, I find myself going to hold my hands up to show it since the camera's not low enough. I'm sitting on my hands trying to stop myself because the only thought running through my mind is swallow that bottle of pills that are on your counter. Swallow that bottle of pills that are on your counter over and over and over again. Nothing bad had happened in my life the two and a half years prior other than laying in that bed. There were no, no one had passed away in my family. There were no divorces or breakups, Okay. And I had never thought of ever hurting myself. So where in the world did that thought come from? Yet I'm having this ideation hit my head over and over and over again. 
And being around family, fortunately, is the reason I'm here right now. I reached out and said, you got to take me somewhere because I can't control these thoughts. I don't know where they're coming from. Not many people voluntarily go to a psych ward, but that's where I went. And I go inpatient at this psych ward and I meet with the attending psychiatrist the first day I'm there. I'm looking at her top doctor plaques on the wall. She's looking at me, looking at my chart. And she says, Eric, you've tried everything there is. Your last resort is to do shock therapy. And so for those who don't know what shock therapy is, they put electrodes on your brain. They shoot you up with general anesthesia. So they put you under and they shock your brain into seizures, hoping that again, almost like a hard restart, your, your brain restarts over again and starts working again. The neurons start firing again. And what scared me was not the shock therapy. What scared me was hearing last resort. Again, everyone on this call, athletic, working with, 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 with students who are athletes, your competitive people who are willing to do whatever to win, okay? But hearing, imagine hearing, unless you do this, nothing will ever work out. That's the scariest thing to hear because you feel like you're done unless this works. And so I do 12 sessions over five weeks of the shock therapy and I leave the hospital feeling no better than I had the previous five, uh, two and a half years. And I retreat back to that twin bed thinking my life is over unless Merck or Pfizer invents some miracle pill that works for me. And all these diagnoses I've been given up to that point, treatment resistant, depression, ADHD, PTSD, OCD, uh, uh, anxiety, every different doctor I'd met with had given me a different label of what I had. And so my parents are both educators, or at least retired at this point. Father was a principal, mother was a language teacher. And so they go to these continuing education courses all the time, usually on topics like global politics or climate change or, you know, uh, hunger and, and, and starvation. Well, they go to this one called integrative breathing practices. I had no idea what the word integrative meant, and I'd never done a breathing practice in my life. So I, it didn't register to me. And so they go, my mom comes back. I remember at nine o'clock at night, I remember it like it was yesterday, looking at the clock. She's like, Eric, I met this woman, Donna. She's amazing. You got to meet her. She treats differently than all these other doctors you've been to. Please go see her. I can't explain it, but she treats differently. And so three days later, I, I, I oblige and I go in her office and I sit in her office and she's the first doctor or practitioner that I've met with in this two and a half year span, whose first question was not, Eric, what are your symptoms? Okay, based on your symptoms, here's your diagnosis. Okay, based on your diagnosis, here's how we're going to treat you. She did the opposite. She said, Eric, tell me about your life. Okay, now think of your students being asked that question. Think of you all being asked that question. That's a pretty broad question. Where do you start when someone says, tell me about your life? And at a point when I didn't have great memories or, or ability to, uh, to, to retrieve those memories, I just thought, oh, I'm in the middle of three boys. We're a sports craze family. Okay, if you're the middle of three boys, tell me about your older brother. So that's me on the right. That's my older brother on the left as point of illustration of our age gap. He's four years older than I am. And so I just start talking. Now, this is the only life I know when I share this. Again, when you think about your own experiences, when you think about the experiences of your, your student athletes, this is the only life I live. So I don't know any different. So I just start saying, oh, when I was eight years old, my older brother broke his femur bone in a sports accident and it cracked his femur bone in half. So he had to put, put in traction and then a body cast for a year and homeschooled. And then a month later, when he healed from that and he came out of the cast, he got diagnosed with ALL, children's form of leukemia. So he went through five years of chemo and radiation back in the late eighties, the drugs weren't really so well targeted or that strong. So it took five years for them to really knock it out of a system, but miracle, you know, he goes into remission. A month later, he's with his friends in a Jeep Wrangler. Friend is driving the car, just bought it, used car, cheaper car, open top, open back, no seatbelt in the back. Car loses control. My brother flies out of the back as they're driving, lands on his head, cracks his head open, loses partial vision in his eye, is in ICU for a month. Heals from that, goes to college, starts feeling a pain in his knee between his junior and senior year, gets all the sports medicine testing, everything comes back negative. They do blood tests and they find out that his cancer is now returned. So now with his cancer returning, they have to give him a much stronger dose of the chemo. In giving him the, smart, the stronger dose of the chemo, I now go to college at this point. He's back down, staying with my parents as he's getting the treatment. And I get a call from my father that he's developed 105 fever. They're taking him to the hospital. His body goes into what's called septic shock. Organs start attacking themselves. It leads him into a coma. And so when I go down there, the neurologist is telling us, we don't know if he's ever going to wake. 
And if he does wake, if he's going to have any, any brain capacity about him whatso whatsoever. And so this goes on for one month, then two months, then three months. Finally, at the end of the third month, he wakes miraculously, got his full cognitive abilities about him. We're all celebrating, but his kidneys fail from the rigor of the septic shock. He has to go on dialysis. We all get tested to see who's the closest match. My father is, donates a kidney to him. Finally, childhood ends. I graduate college. I go to work for the NBA. You get the childhood stuff out of your mind. You're moving forward, blank slate. That first year working at the NBA between the ages of 22 and 23, three of my close friends I grew up with passed away, obviously unrelated to one another from heart conditions. And so when I shared this, you know, kind of just verbal diarrhea almost in a way with this woman, she says, Eric, is there anything else that happened to you in your life that impacted your mental health? Very important point when we're working with student athletes. These things happened to me from the time I was eight until I was 22, 23 years old. I'm sitting in this woman's office at 35 years old, 12 or 13 years after the major events that I talked about. And she's connecting what happened to me then with how I'm feeling now. And I said, Donna, what do you mean affected my mental health? These happened to my brother. These happened to my friends. These just didn't happen to me. And so sports analogy, again, to her credit, she's not a sports person. She said, Eric, you had a front row seat. If you had a front row seat for a basketball game and these big seven foot players are running up and down the court and they're sweating or they're diving for a loose ball and they land in your lap, your suit's going to get sweaty. You're going to bring it home after three hours of washing the game, get it ready for the dry cleaners, take a shower and put a new suit on the next day. But if you have a front row seat for the game of life and the game of life is represented by your brother in a wrestling match against that game of life and your friends in a wrestling match against that game of life and it's a muddy wrestling match and every move they make, they're hitting the canvas and the mud is splattering up and hitting you and splattering up and hitting you in that front row seat. Your suit's going to get very dirty. I didn't use brown here because it would have been gross. So I used green instead. But it would get dirty. It would start caking up on you. And because you're focused on playing sports and working in sports in your life, you're not noticing that these things are building up on your body and getting heavier and heavier and heavier. They're hurting your performance. They're collectively making things, yep, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Awesome book. So over time, this stuff is building up on you your performance is getting worse and worse and worse. You don't realize it because you're so focused on, hey, I got to get the task at hand done and I'm already able to do it at a high level. And eventually you get to the point where it's so heavy, your body, the reason you came to me at 35 with such a major decline is because you were able to push through it so well for all those years that it just stopped you in your tracks and your body said, we can't do this anymore. And so my reaction to her was, Donna, I appreciate what you're saying to me. It's funny that I called it a theory back then, but I said this theory of yours about how stuff builds up in us, in our bodies over time, that you'll see a lot in that book that, that was just posted by Bessel van der Kolk is, I said, take my story out of it for a second. The average 15-year-old child, 20 years younger than I am right now, they've seen, if you're talking about all it takes is seeing things happen to other people in our lives, so a child has seen their parents fight and go through a divorce. A child that's seen their parents lose their job and potentially lose the house. A child that's seen their two best friends friendship dissolve. A child that sees their best friend be in a relationship with a significant other and get broken up with and be crushed. A child that's seen their friends being verbally abused in front of a, a, a group of people by an adult or, or bullied on a schoolyard or hearing about their friend being sexually abused or watching their friend go through the sickness of a loved one or a loss of loved one, which is this list right here. And I said, I don't know a single person in this world by the age of 15 who hasn't been through one summer, many of those challenges. So if that's what you're telling me that this is what contributes to mental health, well then who the hell's mental health hasn't been impacted? And so she kind of takes a step back. She says, Eric, that's how I feel about mental health. Unfortunately, that's not how our society looks at mental health. And so, you know, looking at today and the things that we're all living through right now, look at how many were impacted by someone who 99.9% .9 of the population never met in person. Celebrities like a, a, a Kobe Bryant, you saw the outpouring of grief when he passed, like the pandemic right now that we're all living through. These outside factors that we live through in life and how they contribute to our mental health. And I promised Mitch on this next part, I wouldn't go into too much of the science of this stuff, but... If plaque builds in our arteries over time from the foods that we eat and the stress that we live through and, and, and our lifestyle, 
why wouldn't it make sense in our cardiovascular system if that stuff builds up that stress and trauma couldn't build up in this other system that we have in our body our central nervous system okay so think of them as cumulative builds and so my doctor sends me this is the part i, I promised mitch i'd be shorter on my doctor sends me to this weekend breathing course where I show up, I'm the only man, only one under 40 and only one born in this country. So it's me and eight Indian women and nine yoga mats. Feel like a fish out of water, but I learn how the breath and doing certain breathing patterns in an exercise, much like how we exercise the body, actually cleanses the body, allows it to relax, allows the cells to, to stop their inflammation from happening, allows our hormones to be secreted at the right levels, or allows this tone in our neck, vagus tone, to actually become smoother and allows our body to relax and say, okay, everything's okay here. <laughs> the, 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 the next shoe is not gonna drop just because it either has in the past or because you're anticipating something bad that might happen. And so I remember doing this practice for, they asked me to stick with it for 40 days. And on the 30th day in, I'm doing it at home 45 minutes a day, I wake up and I look at the TV and my first thought is, holy shit, I wanna turn the TV on, this is amazing. And I want scrambled eggs for breakfast two feelings I had not had in the whole two and a half years prior, and they came back to me. And it felt like Christmas morning or first night of Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate, it felt amazing. And at that point, when I started to feel better, not necessarily emotionally, but at least cognitively, I decided I was going to share my story. And I put my, I didn't have social media. I'm not a social media person. At least I, I wasn't before any of this. And so the only thing, I didn't have Instagram or Twitter, I had LinkedIn, because that's where sports executives stayed in touch with one another. And I write this long ass story, believe it or not, a lot longer than I just told all of you. It takes 35 minutes to read it. It's at the time when uh, LinkedIn didn't have any character limits. Kevin Love hadn't come out with a story yet. DeMar DeRozan hadn't come up with a story yet. So I didn't have a template for how you're supposed to share. So all I know is just giving details of stuff. And I put all the details out there. And I put at the suggestion of my friend who's in digital marketing, He's like, this is way too friggin' long. No one's going to read this thing. So just put your telephone number at the top. If people want to call you, they'll call you. They'll reach out. And so I do that on LinkedIn. This is middle of 2017. And in three days, it gets shared, not read, shared over 150,000 times on LinkedIn. And I have over 400 calls that come in from as far as China. And the calls that are coming in that I'm getting back to these people on it's the same thread throughout. It might not seem it when I first say it, but no one is sharing a disorder label. No one's saying, Eric, I have PTSD also, or Eric, I have depression. It's different than PTSD in this way. Instead, everyone's sharing a lived experience with me. Eric, I lost a child to SID, sudden infant death syndrome five years ago, and I've never been the same. All the way to I had a young woman who's 27 years old and said, Eric, I'm married two years now. I've got a, a beautiful child. I love my husband. He's my soulmate but I broke up with my college boyfriend at 22 years old. And I had this pit in my stomach because we had dated for four years. I knew it was going to change the course of our lives. And that pit in my stomach, despite the fact that everything's great now with my current husband, that pit in my stomach has never gone away. Remember going back to that stuff that we think about, like being on the plane and how it sticks with us. And so I became fascinated with why is it that we as a society don't connect the dots on it being about the lived experiences that impact us and that being the common thread. And instead, it's about disorders and labels and all these other things that make us feel like we're in two separate groups, not like what I was showing in the beginning of that page, that first slide, where we're all on it together. And this is what I noticed are the major communication tools that are still used. Okay, last I checked in terms of going doing an audit of them was the end of 2020, but this was definitely the case in 2017. If you go to the largest nonprofits, largest government agencies in our country, here are the three threads that I found that I think were well-intentioned or still well-intentioned, but actually move us further away from understanding this topic. The first one is the stat that gets perpetuated. One in five are mentally ill. Okay. Well, that's huge. That's a big number. 40, over 40 million Americans. The number that's much bigger than one in five is the other side, the four in five. Because what are we telling those people? Because if you don't fit in the mentally ill category, and that's the only topic we're talking about when it comes to mental health is disorder and who's mentally ill. And when I ask a room of kids that question, what are you if you're not in the one in five, the answers that I get is healthy, fine, normal, okay. It's not the case. We're all impacted by the things that happened to us from our past. They impact our performance as well. Next thing, 
All the campaigns were an action word followed by stigma. Stop the stigma, stop the stigma, break the stigma, erase the stigma. Well, the term stigma means there's a group of people forming opinions and judgments about another group of people. You all coach teams together. Imagine your teams were broken up into two groups. The people who are doing something, the players who are doing something, and then everyone else who is making unfair judgments and opinions about those players who are doing that one thing. That wouldn't bring your team together. That would separate them further apart. It'd be a great rallying cry for the people who believe they're being unfairly uh, thought about, but it would make the rest of the group feel like you're slapping their fingers, you're slapping their, their wrist for what they're doing. The way in which celebrity stories were shared. And, you know, I gave the endorsers for athletes, so they would share the story that would appear in an Us Weekly or a People magazine. And it was things like Britney Spears shaves her head because she has depression, or Lindsay Lohan has anxiety, she's a hot mess. Or now going to sports, you know, uh, uh, Andrew Luck, he's a snowflake because he couldn't play anymore because he just couldn't hack it. Or Everson Griffin, he went crazy and he chased people down on the parkway. Or again, Kevin Love ran off the basketball court. Well, you add these three things up, one in five are mentally ill, we got to stop stigmatizing that group. And that group looks like people who are snowflakes, shave their heads, run off basketball courts, and yell and scream at people on the parkway. Do we now wonder why we as a society don't understand this topic? Do we wonder why our kids are afraid to bring it up because they're going to be afraid to put in a bucket if this is what is thought of them if they bring it up? Even with Hayden Hurst, who we work with, he and his mom were the ones who made sure that that Baltimore Sun article was titled like this, struggled with his mental health, hopes to help others. And look at what TMZ does with it. Now, TMZ is perverse, but I can tell you there were a ton of, of, of uh, outlets that wrote this. They took something he wrote in the article and it became, I cut my wrist in college. That's why we created the concept of same here. Because instead of talking about it, about one in five, we got to talk about this as five and five, what everyone goes through. Instead of talking about, about stop the stigma against one group of people, it's we're all the same because we all go through different challenges that put us all in, on the same team together. And even though it happens at different levels and different times in our life, it actually happens to every single one of us. And so we got lucky in that starting to tell this story, we started to reach out to mostly athletes. So it is extended beyond that. People like Hayden Hurst, like Amani McGee Stafford from the WNBA or Chimiko Holtzclaw from the WNBA or Robin Lerner, who now plays in the NHL. And you'll see in a second, where's the hashtag on his helmet or an Amanda Beard, who, who is an Olympic swimmer, even someone like Kobayashi. I don't know if you consider competitive eating hot dogs a sport, but it's pretty freaking cool that, you know, someone like that joins it. And their goal in sharing and understanding being a part of this is what they're sharing is not their label. They're sharing their story of what they've been through in life. You know, in, in Chamiqua's case, the loss of her grandmother at a pivotal point in her life and her grandmother being like a parental figure to her. And so instead of looking at it that way, what we as a society do, and oftentimes, especially in a clinical sense, is we look at the two Ds, disorder and diagnosis, bipolar, anxiety, ADHD, depression, et cetera. This is really what we feel, what our student athletes feel on a daily basis that is related to mental health hurting, foggy, numb, exhausted, stressed, struggling, unhappy. These are the symptoms that start to develop, but we write them off because unlike where we roll an ankle or we break a leg, okay, or we hurt our shoulder, when these things happen, we're like, oh, I probably just slept on the wrong side of the bed. Or oh, I probably drank a little bit too much the night before. That's probably what it's from. We justify when we feel these things. So we end up looking at it as Unless you are this far end where you've got this genetic thing, you live in this mental illness bucket, you are mentally well, you're in that other bucket. And that's not the case. This is the case for every single one of us, every single one of your athletes, is that we live on this continuum. This is something we use in every school we work with, every college we work with, even when we do separate work with coaches, is creating similar language and saying, there is no good kid, bad kid, sick kid, healthy kid, weak kid, strong kid. There's life experiences that we are going through that fluctuate us up and down on this continuum. And we can move anywhere on that continuum, any given day, week, month, year, we move up and down on there. And that doesn't make us bad. If we're sinking for a number of days in a row, what can we do? What control do we have to start to work on that instead of saying, well, that's the sick kid. They're in a bad place. We don't play them ever again, or they're never going to get better. I worked with a, a youth, uh, a, a woman in youth hockey, 15 years old, her coach said to her after she brought up how she was feeling, you can't come back to the team until your bright-eyed and bushy-tailed self and you're cured. 
that story went on ESPN just because of how that was treated. That's the misunderstanding that's in this space, that it's an either or, that it's a binary topic. And so this slide is probably the most important slide of this entire presentation. It's a simplistic overview. But if you think of your brain as a balloon, and that balloon over time fills with air, and that air is our lived experiences. And our lived experiences when we're younger are things like, you know, the blue air, which is seeing the ice cream man for the first time, or the, you know, going on a swing set for the first time. Or the red air, the negative things are things like stubbing your toe or your parents grounding you, right? Well, what's starting to happen is you're seeing the balloon start to fill with that air. Now, why is the red in the back? Because our coping mechanism as humans is to push everything to the back. You're going to see in a second all the isms that we as coaches say to players because in a game, it's helpful to get them to concentrate on just the game and block everything else out. Well, we, our, our nature is to push everything back. And then when we get older, the blue becomes things like meeting the love of our life or getting the dream job that we have. And the red becomes things like losing people and, and, and watching people get sick. And what you're starting to see happen is over time, the red expands so much, it starts to get into Blue. That's what fogginess is, and all those things that I was describing want to be medication bash, and I myself Lexapro still. It's a tissue paper that you see climbing up in there. You'd love for where it works because it doesn't work in everyone's case. Medication is almost like a symptom management tool, like a piece of tissue paper that goes in between that red and blue air. It stops the most negative effects from happening in a symptom management type of way. But what is a piece of tissue paper? It's only as strong as the thickness of that piece of tissue paper. So if we do nothing from an exercise standpoint, from that stuff that goes in our life, that red that continues to build up, what starts to happen is that tissue paper is only so strong and it starts to break. And what you'll eventually see happening is the red breaking through into there, we learned this in second grade, red and blue mixed together, they become purple. That's where real feelings of disorder start, right? So disorder is something that can be developed in any of us. And genetics is the size of that balloon can be different for each of us. And so over time, any of us can get to this point. That's why there's that continuum. And mental illness is just a place on that continuum. It's not the entire continuum. So the good news is, despite the fact that this can happen, someone is not damaged and, and, and their life lost just because this has occurred. We're able to do something we call release and rewiring, actually dragging the red air out of that balloon and dragging it back down out and releasing it out, rewiring it and releasing it out. So we call it STAR, Stress and trauma, active release and rewiring. I'm going to get to that in a second. So I mentioned that we work with Hayden Hurst. So I wanted to show a picture of him from college. He looks like this monster of a man, cut up, you know, as in good shape as you could possibly imagine. This is what we see on the outside. This is what Hayden was carrying on his backpack, what we call the invisible backpack of stuff from his childhood that he was holding onto. He had two family members that had died by suicide. He was struggling himself in sports and couldn't locate the, 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 the catcher's mitt. He was pitching and on his way to becoming a professional baseball player. It was playing with his mind. He's carrying around this bag. And here's the thing. We think because he's got a scholarship or because he's got sports that keep him focused, we don't see the stuff in the top. All we see is the stuff on the left. We see this behemoth of a person who's able to perform at what we believe to be a high level. Same thing here. When we see a physical injury, we see it. We see the person on the sideline. We see them get the, the cast on their, on their leg. But when there's a mental health injury, we're not seeing that bag. We're not able to notice it. We don't know what our players are carrying around. And how does that work over time? I mentioned Shamiko before. When that red expands, Shamiko went through a lot in her life besides the loss of her grandmother. If you guys all saw the documentary on Tiger Woods, this is a guy whose father from, talk about perfectionist attitude. He's gonna be the savior of the world. He's gonna be bringing together all different races. He's gonna be the best golfer that there ever was. He's never gonna make a mistake. Eventually over time, even though he was able to block everything out and push it to the back, that red air gets big enough, that starts to creep in and that starts to impact us. And so I saw this, ironically, this campaign yesterday and it, it just, jumped out of me. I was like, that's freaking awesome, is that you don't have to be sick to get better. 
we perform and we feel certain ways. And we're used to getting to that performance level and feeling that certain way because incrementally we change over time. But is there a way we could feel and perform better even though we're not at the place of disorder? Because when it comes to physical health, the second we start seeing ourselves or an athlete put weight on or get out of shape, we're like, you know, start eating better, start getting in the gym, start working out more. We feel like we can have control over it. But when our brain incrementally starts to not feel as well, we don't do anything about it. We don't have a routine. And if you ask an average college student, what are 15 things they can do for their physical health in this left column over here? They've all been inside a gym many times in their lives. So they go elliptical, treadmill, boxing, kickboxing, swimming, universal weights, <coughs> free weights, rowing. They can name it. And we call these people warriors because they're the first ones in the gym and then the last ones out. And then you ask them what exercises, what routines can you do for your mental health? And they're like, headspace, calm, maybe yoga. They know one or two and it's usually app based. So if someone goes to therapy, their peers start to call them weak. Instead of looking at this, like we have a gym for the body. Why don't we have a gym for the brain? It would be called a gym for the brain if this is what we did to fix our brain and to work on our brain and actually get tools to go in there and start tweaking it around like we do with arthroscopic surgery. But that's not how work for the brain and gym for the brain actually works. Instead, since we don't go to those things, here's what we see. Yes, student athletes, but everyone for this matter, go towards to get away from that pain of the heaviness of the bag that they're carrying. When they're on downtime and they're not playing their sport, not everyone goes to this. I'll show you in a second how it's hard to notice it, but they go to things like this, this figure looks like Charlie Sheen, but caffeine, sex, alcohol, prescription drugs, money. Here's what I was saying. It's hard to see sometimes work. My addiction was work. All these things I had seen as a child, I didn't realize it. I was avoiding dealing with those negative situations that I had gone through and actually approaching them and working through them by burying myself in the work that I was doing. Recreational drugs. And the reason why I have a baseball up there is, yes, I see it all the time. The athletes, even at the professional level, who are the first ones on the field and the last one off. I'm not saying we shouldn't applaud that. But what I am saying is we should be looking in that and saying, is this person working on themselves because they are carrying other stuff? And how could we make sure they're working on themselves? Are they as focused on this sport as they are because they're trying to tune everything else out where they have just this tunnel vision alone? So I mentioned STAR standing for stress and trauma, active release and rewiring. What we end, I ended up doing is after I healed through breathing, I went on this odyssey for as many places I could go to with the little bit of money that I had to afford. I, I flew to Jakarta, Indonesia to learn about Qigong meditation, flew out to Arizona to learn about a practice called TRE, trauma releasing exercises, where you could literally tremble trauma out of your system. And what I noticed is just like we have a brain, a, a, a gym for the body, and I mentioned all those different exercises we can do, we have a gym for the brain. These, these practices exist. We just don't look at it this way. We look at headspace and we say, oh, I can do other stuff beyond medication. And if this, this, this meditation thing on this app works good, if not, I guess there's nothing else for me. And that's not the case. We've got all these things that we could do. So we make these available through things like cards that student athletes can get their hands on and actually read and do the exercise at home. Or you guys can have in your gyms to be able to use kind of like how we used to have the old school charts on the walls when 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 gyms first became popular, which is funny enough to think about it in the 80s and even the late 70s for that matter. Okay, so I mentioned I'd go into three things that we as coaches often say that really are helpful on the field, but now athletes often take those comments and they say, okay, well, I guess this means I should be this way. Uh, all the time, even off the field. And that's no one's fault. That's just, they look at us as their, you know, primary figures of where to go to for help and for information. So these three things that come up, forget about the last play and move on to the next one. Important thing to do in a 60 minute game. But when we forget about the last play and move on to the next one, when it comes to life, that stuff cumulatively builds. Okay, next one, I gotta move this here because the chat's in the way. Be mentally tough. Never show your opponent weakness, right? We got to show them that they can't get to us. Again, great in a 60-minute game, but what does that tell an athlete about what they're going to be willing to communicate with us off the court, off the field, off the ice when the game is over? Next one. Oh. 
proper execution of this play requires you to hit this line at this exact angle as you look for this exact pass. Again, I'm a geek for my, my high school coach going all the way back to high school, my basketball coach in high school. I love that he was a stickler for the details. But as a young athlete, as you get that ingrained in your head that it must be done this exact way, it's great for us to know that and to have to know how that opens up a certain angle in a game to open up a play for us to be able to score. But also understanding that this perfection doesn't need to be the case in everything that we do from a social aspect as well, that we're talking about specifically what's taking place in our sport on the field, on the ice. And by the way, if we make a mistake, even though we try to get that perfection, we're going to get it next time. So game of life, there's many last plays in life that accumulate if we don't work on them. Wearing the mask eventually breaks us down. It's constant. It's a taxing act. And your athletes got here with a perfectionist attitude. Life is not perfect. That eventually destroys us over time if that's what we're holding on to always. And so we asked your athletes at the end of the call, which this is what I'll end on right here, and we can go into a little bit of Q&A, though, Mitch, you can tell me from a timing standpoint how we're doing, is first takeaway from the athletes was to make sure our coaches understand that it's not you're either sick or you're healthy when it comes to mental health, but that, that mental health actually lives on this continuum and that they might be feeling things even though they're not at the place of disorder. Second thing they asked us to share was that whatever they're feeling does impact their performance. That despite the fact that you might see them as the top player on that team or a great role player on that team, that it does impact their ability to perform at their best level when there are things that they're carrying, like those heavy bags that get in the way. And that by putting time towards it, they actually might be able to perform at an even better level. That they want it worked into their exercise and training. That's where those star exercises come in. And you might say, we hear from student athletes all the time. They're stressed for time. They don't have enough. They have too much on their plate. How could they be asking for other stuff? What I'm sharing here is working on these star exercises is five minutes here every three hours, 10 minutes there. There's a guy named Mike Mowdy, played for the Penn State Nittany Lions. He was a linebacker, went on a play in the NFL, had his colon removed because he had Crohn's and colitis and still went on and played two more years. And he gave one of the best analogies I've ever heard when it comes to how we put an extra time. He said, Eric, said, well, he didn't say it to me. He was saying it to this group. He said, if I have a twin brother who's my exact size, and Mike's a pretty big dude, he's 6'4", 240, linebacker. He said, if the two of us were put where we grew up in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the south part of the United States, and our father gives us both the exact same ax and gives us both six hours to chop down as many trees as we can, and it's a contest and we're going to win money, whoever chops down the most trees and we're competitive. And I start chopping down those trees. My brother starts chopping down those trees and we're looking at the clock because we only have six hours. And I'm looking at my brother and he's making good, good progress and I'm making good progress. I stop every hour for five minutes to go and sharpen my ax. But my brother chops for all six hours straight. I've only chopped for five and a half hours and I've sharpened my ax for the other 30 minutes right? Six hours times five minutes. My brother, nonstop, he's a workhorse. He's gone through it. Who chops down more trees? And he said, I'm going to chop down more trees because I'm going to have a sharper ax to be able to be more efficient in that five and a half hours that I work. So again, I'm not expecting that people can totally re-rig re their whole schedule, but finding ways to work these practices in when you see them, they are five and 10 minutes at a time in between going to your strength and conditioning coach asking for this when they're in the gym or telling them to do this at home. Final two, they wanted to be able to take mental health days, okay? And I, I, when they said that to me, I know that that's gonna come with a little bit of pushback. I think, you know, if you wanna look up an interesting story on this, there's a woman, Liz Cambridge, who played in the WNBA for the Las Vegas Aces. She said, why are we not allowed to have the designation when we're not feeling right in the game? DNP did not play mental health because there's a fear that athletes are going to take advantage of it. The question I got to ask is when it comes to whether we allow people to take off or not is, are we cutting our nose to spite our face? There's definitely people that can take advantage of it. I'm not denying that. But for the kids who actually need it, if we're able to open up that conversation and make it one where they're comfortable asking for it when they need it, 
might we get better health and then ultimately better performance out of them as long as they're not taking advantage of it as long as when we see it we recognize that we're open communication with them is that going to lead to better results and then the final thing that they asked for was vulnerability from up above and vulnerability you know i do these with ceos as opposed to coaches all the time and these are people who walk around in their blue pinstripe suits pastel ties and brown shoes and they are teflon don and donna and they don't love opening up. So that, Eric, what do you want me to share that, that, I, you know, I have, I have bipolar or that my, I had a family member that died by suicide. No, I want you to share something that's got going on in your life. That's difficult. Uh, one of the most poignant uh, conversations I ever had, we were in a group of coaches with Providence college and um, their, their head basketball coach just slammed his fist when I made this point. And he goes, Eric, I grew up and I was essentially homeless for four years. My dad had me living on my uncle's couch. And whenever I go in and I recruit kids, I share my story of being homeless because it got me to where I am right now. But I know when I share that, there's going to be an openness for them to share with me whatever's going on in their life. So sharing vulnerably doesn't mean having to come clean about a label. It doesn't mean having to come clean about something that's private. It just means every so often sharing, you know what? This is something difficult in my life that I faced, but this has made me so much stronger that I went through it. And now I've been able to get somewhere because of it. All right, Mitch, hopefully timing wise, I, I, I nailed exactly what you were asking, asking for. <laughs> Someone just wrote taking off the mask. Exactly. And by the way, with taking off the mask, it, I'll give you a quick 30 second story here. There's a school district K through 12 in Jacksonville and they created a campaign that they just recently launched called take off your mask and it's kids taking off the physical mask now because we're in the middle of pandemic it's florida okay and you have this fight going on between the the, the parents who believe that you can't confuse people with that messaging because a mask needs to be worn more now because of what's going on with the pandemic with the administrators who are like this is an important message, especially even now, because if they don't take their mask off and start talking, these kids are going to start spinning because of all that they're thinking about not being in school together at this time, being able to discuss. Anyway, I love messages like that. We work with an organization called the Goalie Guild. So anyone who has uh, goalies in soccer, in hockey, in lacrosse, they have like 25,000 goalies from around the world. The name of their campaign is called Lift the Mask, not Take Off the Mask. Same concept here, being open, sharing our stuff as opposed to sharing our labels. Mitch, you want to hop back on with me here? I'm, I'm here with you. So um, you, 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 you got in there within a little over the hour. You did an awesome we, job. We didn't start, we didn't start till a little after. So <laughs> I, I, I gave myself a little cushion. Okay, but thank you. Uh, I did want to allow some folks, if there's any questions right now, um, uh, obviously I think Eric's got some contact information up there that if you wanted to, uh, contact him off the side, uh, feel free to do it. I think though that, you know, the, I think the information that um, he's able to bring from the student athletes on Wednesday's meeting to you today was uh, really important. And hopefully it's something that uh, can be, uh, you know, put into place. But if there's anybody with any questions uh, at this point, um, feel free to uh, chime in. Otherwise we're gonna, uh, Thank Eric for all his time, and we'll, we'll we will be sending out a survey uh, just like we did uh, after the first speaker. And uh, looks like you're getting a lot of people saying thank you, thank you. Um, I, I want to give you all credit. I'm seeing like some of the um, the titles on here that there are mindfulness coaches on here, and it, it warms my heart to see this. I, I I love that you guys are in this space and talking about this stuff. I, I got to tell you, when I first did it two years ago. Um, when we started with the colleges, the, 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 the folks who are at the counseling centers or even the sports psychology groups were saying, you know, unless a suicide happens on campus, it's really hard for us to get resources to talk about these things. It's almost like we're waiting for a crisis to happen in order to get more resources. So I love the fact that you all are actually, you know, uh, uh, motivating and getting people in and getting people who are talking about this is, is amazing. So I, and and I, I don't see him on screen right now, but the gentleman who was from Chico State, I could have sworn we were on a panel together as well. I don't know if he's still on anymore, Mitch, but uh, it's cool to be able to cross paths with you all and see 
kind of the fabric of this stuff mixing together is, uh, is, is incredible. And that's what we need to really raise a level of this. Awesome stuff. So, uh, Eric, thank you much. Um, we will be in contact with you, I'm sure. And again, I'll, uh, I'll pass your contact information on to everybody so that if they want to uh, contact you later, they, they certainly can. It looks like we've got some people who would be interested in some of the information that you have. Uh, For sure. Down the road. I'll send a link to the star exercises stuff also, yeah. uh, Mitch. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you much. Thank you all for uh, for joining us, Eric. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. Please stay safe and, and do wear your mask. Wear your mask. <laughs>